So here in Holy Family, uh, we try to have the most rounded formation that we can. So we have our studies and we have our community time and we have our prayer time. And we also have uh, game time occasionally, which can consist of anything from um, rounders, football, hikes, uh, to indoor games, card games, board games, mafia, if you've ever heard of it, and uh, murder in the dark and various things like that. What's interesting is, uh, in these different games or in these different uh, activities, different parts of a person are revealed, right? So uh, during study, tend to pe people tend to be somewhat passive. Some will have be sitting up nice and perky with their 17 color pens in front of them, all perfectly parallel, ready to take notes. Others will slouch somewhat, but they tend to be somewhat like, you know, there's no major, major differences. Whereas when it comes to games, people's competitive streak, people's... Um, honesty, dishonesty, people's <laughs> desire to win, all this kind of thing becomes much more apparent. Uh, like the different things that we do reveal different things about a, a person. And what's interesting is to discover something about a person you, that you thought you knew. And then you see a different side to them. You see a different side to them. Now, if that's true of us mere human beings, right? How much greater is that truth as regards the Lord? Okay, that while we know him, there's still so much more that we don't know about him. Now, obviously, when it comes to the Lord, there's still so much more goodness of him that we don't know yet. There's still so much love, mercy, tenderness, compassion, uh, his, his plan of love. There's still, there's still so much yet to be discovered, which is, I think, a, a, a fantastic way of looking at our faith and our relationship with the Lord rather than thinking. And this, this can happen as well, where once I've got to the level of believing that he exists, that's it. Job done. There's, the, there's so much more. You know, believing he exists, it's a good start. It's a necessary foundation for everything else. Once you have your sight, your, your, your slab laid for your sight, she ain't that pretty. Like, there's nothing really useful you can do with it unless you start building on it. So, believing he exists is a necessary foundation. Absolutely. But then there's a whole relationship that can be built up. And the more we bring him into different aspects of our lives, the more we see who Jesus is and how Jesus is and what Jesus once and how he guides us and how he blesses us and how he has protected us and how he has helped us weave our way uh, through life. So Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the last reading, last line of our first reading from the letter to the Hebrews today. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So while there's still more that we have to discover about him, it's the same Jesus. It's the same Jesus who spoke on the shore, to the great crowds. <clears throat> it's the great, same Jesus that was baptized by John who we heard about in our gospel today. It's the same Jesus who healed. It's the same Jesus who was crucified. It's the same Jesus who rose. It's the same Jesus who walked on the water. It's the same Jesus who appeared in the room with the apostles. Uh, it's the same Jesus who ascended into heaven and gave this great commission to the apostles to go out and make disciples of all the nations. It's the very same Jesus who is in his glory in heaven. That same Jesus who we encounter, relate to, are trying to discover through our celebration of the liturgy. It's the very same Jesus, it's the same person. It's kind of incredible, really. It's, it, it's, it's not a kind of a reflection or just stories about him. Like, we're trying to en encounter a person here, the person of Jesus Christ. And, and it's the same Lord who we hear about today, who lives in us, who we receive in Holy Communion, who one day we hope to spend all of eternity in front of in heaven. It's the same Lord. And there's so much more for us to discover about him. And the more we live our lives with him, the more we will discover. It's, to be honest, for all eternity, we will be discovering the ever greater depths of his love and mercy because he's infinite, we're not. So it's, just, it's, 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 it's kind of fascinating. It's good to have these thoughts at times that kind of maybe blow open our complacency or our kind of being settled at a certain level of prayer or a certain level of as it might be called today spirituality and just kind of oh, I've reached this kind of plateau so we're good there's, there's always more there's always more we can always have a deeper relationship with the Lord that's that direction we can always know him better we can always go deeper you know we can always we can always do more which doesn't necessarily mean that we, ha we have to spend more time on our needs because that's simply not always possible especially if you're if you have a career, if you're teaching, if you're working in an office, if you're 
a mom or a dad uh, at home with kids, you don't, you haven't got the time to 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 to, to pray three rosaries a day and do a holy hour. It's just it, the the time is not there. Or if that happens, there's going to be a child sitting in a dirty nappy during your holy hour. Not ideal. Not ideal. So sometimes it's just not possible to do more. But can we do what we were doing deeper? Can we do what we were already doing, but do it deeper? And if it's the same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever, there's another important aspect and maybe an important distinction uh, that we need to, to keep in mind as well. When people look at the church and they see that there are problems, that there are you know, issues, that you, there are, we're missing a generation or two at this stage, the younger people and the parents of the younger people tend not to attend. That's just, that's just statistics. Uh, that's what we see. Uh, the younger people tend not to, uh, to frequent the sacraments on a regular basis. So the danger here <coughs> is, is the lack of, of the following distinction. There's, there's a distinction in theology which is very important between doctrine and discipline. Right? Doctrine, <coughs> that's what the church teaches. <coughs> things that are immutable, things that will not change. The moral teaching of the church, for example, and therefore the moral teaching of scripture, the moral teaching of God himself, this will not change, okay? Uh, rape was wrong in Jesus' time, it's wrong now, it'll be wrong in a thousand years. Uh, <coughs> murder was wrong a thousand years ago, it was wrong in Jesus' time, uh, it'll be wrong in a thousand years' time. Fornication, so sex outside of marriage, it was wrong in Abraham's time, it's wrong in Jesus' time, wrong in our time, it'll be wrong in in a thousand years. These things will not change. They're immutable, right? Uh, the moral teaching will not change because morality remains the same, okay? These things won't change. Um, as regards the sacraments, the way the Lord has established the sacraments, the way he instituted the sacraments, this will not change because they're already instituted. We can't undo what Jesus did, okay? Now, we can, now that there are matters of discipline which can change. So, uh, the church could decide, for example, to write a new Eucharistic prayer. The words of the institution of the Eucharist will remain the same because they have to. That's a matter of doctrine. But like there, there are four Eucharistic prayers. There are other Eucharistic prayers I, I tend not to use, but they're, they're approved. They work fine. That's a matter of discipline. So discipline can change. Doctrine cannot. The danger today is when we see people not attending Mass, we say, ah, change the doctrine, and then people will come back. You know, change what the church teaches as regards morality, sexuality, change these things, and then people will come back. Firstly, that has never worked in the history of any Christian denomination in the world ever. When they've, when they've tried, to, tried to change the doctrine to make it more palatable, people tend to leave. It, it tends to have the, actual, the opposite effect. And secondly, even if our numbers quadrupled, what is the point of filling our church if our teaching is compromised. You know, what is the point of filling a church where, Jesus, you have your teachings and, and we have ours. So Jesus, look, we'll come to a compromise. We'll take some of your teachings, the ones that we like, and we'll stick in some of ours as well, and we'll come to this nice happy compromise. All right? it, like, why, why would we want a church filled with people who don't think that the Lord's teaching is worth following? I mean, that, that's a, a trajectory bound for disaster. So we just have to be so, so careful that in, in a time of crisis or in a time of change, we know what can be pruned or cleaned and what can't. So the solutions like to, to uh, uh, decreasing numbers or, or maybe the church losing its voice somewhat, the, church, the solution is not to change the church's doctrine. Ever. Ever. We may there may be issues of, 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 of discipline that could be changed, but to be honest, in our present situation, that's not what's going to renew the church anyway. It's faith that we need to renew the church, not changing of teachings, either discipline, discipline or doctrine. Neither of those need to be touched at the moment. They're not the problem. They're not the problem. The problem is the lack of faith, that lack of a profound relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what makes the church inspirational. That's what makes people look at the church and go, wow, I see all these people going to Mass. <clears throat> They're so united. They're a family. They're something different about them. There's like a, a peace about them. And all this pandemic, people are going crazy and they're worried and, and, and they're scared. And yet these people who, who pray, they just seem to have this, this peace about them. They just seem to have something otherworldly about them. 
And I hear they, they pray this rosary or something every evening. What is that? How does that work? Do you know, it's, it's when our faith is lived and it's beautiful, it's attractive, and it actually sets us apart. It makes us different. That's what makes it magnetic. That's what makes it attractive. It's our own way of, of doing mission, just by simply living the Catholic faith, living it well, living it profoundly, living it in the way that how we speak about people, how positive we are, how hopeful we are, and most importantly, how love-filled we are. So we do all that we do because we love the Lord. Everything stems from this relationship with Jesus. So, um, say it's a piece of negative, although I think I've overshot my time, so we'll have to skip that one. Uh, let us always remember that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Lord that we pray to today, the Lord that you're going to be praying for your children for at this Mass, the Lord that you're entrusting your various intentions to, the Lord that we will be entrusting the, uh, our, our prayers of the faithful here to, it's the same Lord who walked the roads of our earth 2,000 years ago, the same Lord who died on the cross, the same Lord who blesses us from the right hand of the Father in heaven. It's the same Jesus that appeared to St. Faustina. It's the same Lord that wants to welcome you into heaven one day. So Lord, for me, as we pray for the renewal of the church, let us pray that people will come to know you, to love you, and to serve you always. Amen.